Hi, uh, my name is Shubhojit Malik and I am from India. My maiden screencast video would be on this amazing topic of flexible electronics and the art of nano manufacturing. So on your screen, uh, towards the left, all right, this one, you see tattoo with embedded electronics and wavy patterns. So we are going to discuss a little bit about Professor John Rogers' work at UIUC and we'll see how we can create or how what are the different routes to high performance single crystalline CMOS integrated circuits and the interesting thing about these circuits are that they're reversibly foldable and stretchable on the right we have the smart contact lenses so if you remember the, uh, the movie Mission Impossible 4 you would remember the scene where Jeremy Renner is wearing these contact lenses and when he blinks twice, the lens takes a photo of the nuclear cords and relays the photo to Polar Patterns printer on the floor above. Uh, recently, Samsung and Toshiba have come out with flexible phones as well. So that is a very interesting avenue. So let's embark on this journey and unravel the mysteries underlying such awesome technology applications. So let's look at the major at some of the major uh, principles which are involved in making these reversibly foldable, stretchable, uh, flexible electronic platforms. So um, these systems actually combine high quality electronic materials such as aligned arrays of silicon nanoribbons with ultra thin uh, elastomeric substrates. The procedure begins with spin casting a sacrificial layer of PMMA out here that you see about 100 nanometers followed by a thin substrate of polyimide both of which are actually coated on a silicon wafer as a temporary carrier. Next a transfer printing process with PDMS stamp actually delivers to the surface of this polyimide organized arrays of N and P doped silicon nanoribbons. So these silicon nanoribbons is actually the place where all the magic happens. So let's take a look at how these silicon nanoribbons are actually made. So first of all an N type silicon on insulator wafer is lightly doped with boron via a spin on dopant at a diffusion temperature of about 550 to 600 degrees centigrade to define P wells. So what we do out here is essentially um, here we see boron as an impurity has, has taken up of the position of a vacant hole. Now how this happens is because during the spin on dopant technique uh, it usually involves exposing the surface of silicon to high temperatures. Now at these elevated temperatures of nearly 600 degrees centigrade right the electrons start moving and they jump around and results in the creation of these holes at these high temperatures vacancies are, cre uh, cre uh, are actually created in the crystal lattice and the impurity atoms that is the boron in this case actually just fills up the hole the dopant ions then come to rest within the silicon lattice and the advantage of this technique is that the dopant profile within the silicon substrate can be really well controlled. So there are a couple of other steps other other techniques involved apart from spin on dopant but the major advantage of spin on dopant is that it's highly controlled. The second step involves silicon is actually doped with phosph phosphorus that is highly doped P type source drain electron electrodes are actually formed besides the P, P wells and the only difference is this time the temperature is actually an elevated temperature of, of about 1000 degrees or 1500 degrees Celsius. The graph out here would give you a clearer idea this graph about how the dopant density uh, uh, and the temperature are related and, and we can see that uh, 
that the p-type dopant actually requires a higher temp uh, dopant density and requires a higher temperature as compared to the n-type. So once this is done, the next step that follows is uh, the lithography steps and dry etching steps which results in the formation of these nano ribbons. Now these nano ribbons are actually uh, released and can be transferred in an organized array from the, the SOI that is the, the uh, insulator that we have at the base to the wafer coated with thin layers of PMMA and this is done using this elastomeric uh, using this elastomeric stamp so this is this is then taken out and then put onto the PI polyamide layer and this is called the transfer printing process the polyamide is then cured for about one and a half hours at, at a again at a temperature of 300 degrees centigrade and the active regions are then isolated um, so that a thin gate of silicon dioxide is then deposited using PECVD that is uh, chemical vapor deposition and the reason we use PECVD is that it forms a passive layer this, this is a formation of a passivation layer um, so once this thing is etched away it, it creates contact windows which, which essentially establishes the various electrical contacts so I've shown uh, an arrow out here and in this way we actually create the holes which, which establishes the electrical contacts now this whole substrate is actually dipped in uh, acetone so that all these sacrificial layers are actually removed uh, and uh, what we essentially get is I'm going back to the slide are these free moving wavy forms now for the formation of stretchable and wavy layouts the circuit is then transformed is actually sorry transferred to an elastomeric substrate of PDMS so this layer that you see is the elastomeric substrate of PDMS so finally what we get is is some sort of a structure like this and and like these and these days we have actually incorporated a lot of sensors like we have a wireless power coil so these coils do not have to be plugged in or anything for that matter uh, they have wireless antennas and photo detectors and for biomedical purposes actually recently I read a paper by Todd Coleman at UC San Diego and he's actually using these these chips flexible electronic uh, tattoos uh, for prenatal healthcare and it's actually giving amazing results because the mother or the woman does not have to uh, does not have to go to the hospital every time and there are no bulky electrodes involved so moving on uh, let's let's investigate how these smart contact lenses are made via flexible electronic platforms and the conceptual diagram is as shown here uh, what happens is the proposed active contact lens system it includes a glucose sensor and an antenna for communication and a readout circuitry so if you see that this is the region for the central visual path this is the biosensor module which is actually in touch with, with the eye or, or which actually takes the teardrop uh, then uh, it measures the number of electrons released sends the signal via this telecommunication and energy transfer antenna and this this whole electronic setup is actually made on the polymer lens platform so the basic chemistry involved about how they the, how this does a glucose sensing is that initially the d-glucose which is which is present in the tear is oxidized to give d-gluconolactone the d is best basically because because it, it changes the direction of the of, of plane polarized light onto the right hand side uh, catalyst used is the glucose oxidase now what happens is the hydrogen peroxide is again oxidized and the two electrons that are released these electrons are what are transferred back and is sent back for for testing so the fabrication starts from a trans uh, from a transparent layer of uh, polyethylene terephthalate uh, and 
then what it does is um, the, so initially the, the, the PET wafer is actually clean with isopropyl alcohol so on and so forth and, and distilled water and then the wafer is actually soft baked for about 20 minutes and exposed so here we see soft is actually soft baked and then exposed and um, then what happens is uh, the, there are these we see three metal layers that are formed that is uh, Ti, uh, palladium and, and now the reason that this palladium is uh, placed in between Ti and, and Pt is because uh, palladium actually works as a metal diffusion barrier layer and it improves the overall signal stability. The reason that the signal stability is, is higher is because uh, it actually increases the overall stability of the reference electrode. So once the reference electrode is, is created then it is fully integrated as a, as a chip that we can see out here. Now the system assembly of the whole chip, the antenna and the glucose sensor is actually pretty interesting. What happens is that um, first initially from the previous step here they are actually uh, cutting out uh, these, these chips and cleaning them from, from the PET films with acetone and then uh, about six, micro layer, uh, 6 micrometer layer of positive photoresist is actually spin coated. Next what happens is they use a mixture of chromium, uh, nickel and gold uh, which are then evaporated and lifted off in acetone to create contacts for solder coating. So here the antenna is actually a very very important uh, important feature so uh, what they have done is um, in order to pattern the antenna they have actually used a 40 nanometer seed layer of, of gold and this is what is used to pattern the antenna uh, and it is then actually etched using a gold etch etchant which is called transine and finally the wafer is actually dried with nitrogen gas and individual contact lenses with about one centimeter diameter are cut out using uh, carbon monoxide laser cutters. So here's a YouTube link that, that really fascinated me uh, and here we, we have the futurist Michio Kaku who is actually saying in the next 20 years the internet will be in our contact lenses and we will simply blink and we'll be online. So I took the liberty of finding this really interesting photo where we have a bunch of interesting stuff. So we have radio power, conversion circuits, we have sensor readouts. I have no idea how a patient or how a person will actually see through this. But anyways, it's, it's still a lot of fun. So uh, and there are energy modules. So I've gone really gung-ho about, about wearable technology and it's really interesting so on and so forth and uh, of course the future of wearable electronics look really fascinating. What is really interesting to see is that the nano manufacturing as technology as we see is slowly turning into an art because the smaller you go the more you know creative you have to get and another interesting aspect or what is really really remarkable is that people across the globe are actually embracing it. So. Uh, unfortunately, flexible electronics uh, does not, you know, is, is does not come that easily. So it has a couple of challenges, like like the hysteresis loss. There are contact effects that I've shown earlier. Because of this, there's a lot of mechanical strain which follows. And uh, what happens is sometimes if you're using it for biomedical purposes, it's not very reliable. So. Um, Let's hope that in future this itsy bitsy teeny weeny little project actually throws up a lot of exciting new devices in, in future. So with this ladies and gentlemen uh, I conclude my screencast video. Please feel free to constructively criticize or appreciate uh, on adcast or via email.
My name is Shubhayat Malik. Wishing you a good day. Over and out.